The real worry in Britain is not autocracy now, but chaos. If governments consistently fail to deliver better living standards, a more secure future for people, they get completely disillusioned with ordinary politics. They think they're all the same and they're all either corrupt or incompetent or both. And that's precisely the situation when they look around and say, well, who's going to save us from this? The fall in the exchange rate made us all poorer. That's, that's without any doubt. But clearly the impact of Brexit is, is, is quite profound. I mean, in a sense, foreign exchange markets were saying you have devalued the economy. You know, I mean, clearly the higher growth we achieved in the run up to 2007, 2008 came at a terrible cost because we then had the worst recession since the war. So first of all, the economic system is not deterministic. It's an outcome, outcome of all sorts of decisions we make. So we've been making the wrong decisions. It's an outcome of how we govern and organize the public sector. There's different ways to do that. How we govern and organize the private sector and how we govern and organize the interrelationship between them. So the ecosystem between these two is very problematic. In today's world, democratic systems face unprecedented challenges. Economist Martin Wolf warns about the growing fragility in democratic capitalism, particularly in Britain. The real worry in Britain is not autocracy now, but chaos, a continued failure and disorder. I would say that at the moment, the real worry in Britain is not autocracy now, but chaos, as a word, disorder, a continued failure. So I would say 10, 15 years from now in Britain, things might be much, much more dangerous than they are now. We don't resolve our economic problems. It's the, so the failure of leadership is the biggest thing. I have been very pleased to see genuinely that the anti-immigration mood of 2016 has got tempered. Weirdly so, since immigration hasn't fallen. So that's a, quite a puzzle. The big challenge for us, the damage of a, of a campaign which was basically populist in its purest form, namely uh, a populist c campaign which was anti-elitist anti -elitist and indulges in fantasy about what would happen, the Brexit campaign. The real danger for me, from my point of view in this country, is that we have no apparent way out of our economic problems and that will create bigger political difficulties down the road. We have to resolve our relationship with Europe on the most favorable possible terms within the constraints of Brexit. I don't believe Brexit can be reversed. In the process, we will remove a lot of the uncertainty from business because they can't plan. And then with less uncertainty and with a good relationship, investment will, with luck, pick up. And that starts creating a self-reinforcing momentum. Secondly, I think there are some really quite important things we can do through taxation to encourage more investment. So I think that Sunak's super deduction, as it's called, which allows him basically every business to write off the expense of investment against their income in full or close to full, should be maintained. We we have to accept that taxing corporate profits while desire, while politically easy means that we get less investment. Third, we have really considerable scientific innovative capacity and we have to put a lot of money, particularly in our universities, but in also some of our leading companies, life sciences, for example. The government has to put, with I think joint public-private partnerships, investment in those sectors in a large way designed to nurture, promote businesses that come out of this. So we've been doing this to some extent. We need to do even more of that. Fourth, the levelling up agenda is a really big deal. And I think we have to put resources in that and we have to genuinely to devolve power to regional and sub-regional governments. Because I think a lot of the problems in our economy come from over-centralisation, massive over-centralisation of decision-making in London. I think we are right to uh, encourage immigration of skilled people from over the world. We're going to need new uh, immigrants and I think that's gone pretty um, pretty well. It's extremely important, it's fifth or sixth, to 
reform our pensions and savings. We have the lowest savings rate in the Western world. Our pensions, our old defined benefit pensions, have been locked up as bond funds. They don't invest in equity and new business at all, which is ridiculous. And our replacement involves too low a contribution rate, which is too low for people that have decent pensions at the end. And in addition, it means our national savings rate. It's too low. He emphasizes that democracy depends on a functioning economic system, which is currently in crisis, a sentiment echoed by Paul Wallace, who describes the economic decline as a result of poor political decisions, particularly Brexit. The impact of Brexit is profound. Foreign exchange markets devalued the economy. Clearly, the impact of Brexit is quite profound. I mean, in a sense, foreign exchange markets were saying you have devalued the economy. I, I look, I compare, for example, the 15 years before 2007, and I then look through between 2007 and 2022, and it's a sort of fairly disastrous story in terms of underlying growth or average growth over that period. In, the, in those 15 years up to 2007, you had the economy growing by almost 3% a year, which was incredibly good for given historical standards. And since then, by little more than 1% a year. If you look at the GDP per person per head, it's even more of a slowdown from around 2.5%. The fundamental reason for that is a collapse in productivity growth. Adding to this, economist Mariana Matsukato highlights the broader systemic failures, where decision-making processes in both the public and private sectors have become problematic. We've been making the wrong decisions, governing the public and private sectors in ways that foster parasitic rather than symbiotic relationships. We've been making the wrong decisions. It's an outcome of how we govern and organize the public sector. There's different ways to do that. How we govern and organize the private sector and how we govern and organize the interrelationship between them. So there's a whole theory behind that in economics. It informs the treasuries, the ministries of finance around the world, austerity, but even the counter to austerity is still framed within a very narrow way of thinking about government. Private sector since the 1980s has basically been convinced that at best it can maximize shareholder value. So over six trillion dollars has been used just to buy back shares by the large corporate to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay. So the ecosystem between these two is very problematic. An ecosystem from a biological point of view could be mutualistic, could be symbiotic, could also be parasitic, could be predator prey. So I think we have a parasitic problematic relationship between public and private. So all those three things, governing the public sector wrongly, always reactive, too little too late because you're fixing failures versus proactively shaping an economy to be inclusive, sustainable, maximizing shareholder value, which means that we have an ultra-financialized private sector and a parasitic relationship between them, we got a mess. And the problem really is we don't have enough strategic visionary uh, governments today. And it's not because people in government are stupid. It's there's so much fear because there's so much ideology. As soon as you make a mistake, front page of the Daily Mail. Um, you're supposed to you know, set the horizontal conditions and get out of the way. Missions are about the verticals, but not the verticals in terms of the sector that you're going to give a lot of money to, the picking winners problem. It's what are the challenges you're going to go after and how can you use every tool you have in government to kind of help really create and catalyze that collective intelligence across the economy it's about is that capacity, that capability. It has been lost slowly over the last years because of the lack of insourcing of the capacity, this outsourcing that we've had. As Britain stands at a crossroads, the intertwined crises of democracy and economics demand more than short-term fixes. With experts like Martin Wolf, Paul Wallace, and Mariana Mazzucato warning of the deeper challenges at play, the question remains. Will the country find the vision and leadership needed to secure its future? Or will continued mismanagement and ideological divides further entrench the chaos? If you liked the video, please like and subscribe to spread more awareness. Share your thoughts in the comments below and join the conversation. Your engagement helps us bring more content to light. Remember, stay informed, stay engaged.